I'm Patrick Pacheco. Coming up on Theater, All the Moving Parts, a chat with Natasha Katz, a Tony-winning lighting designer who thinks of herself as half sculptor, half painter, and whose gallery is nothing less than the entire stage. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Theater All the Moving Parts. Today's guest is lighting designer Natasha Katz, a six-time Tony Award winner who is responsible not only for what an audience sees, but more importantly, what an audience feels. As an artist whose palette can include thousands, if not millions of choices, how does she ever arrive at the moment when the light bulb in her head goes off? We're about to find out. Welcome, Natasha, and I am delighted to be speaking with you. Thank you, Patrick. I'm so happy to be here virtually. I wanted to start off our conversation by asking you that as a lighting designer, you describe yourself as part sculptor and part painter. What did you mean by that? Well, as a lighting designer, when there are actors on stage and scenery and costumes, which are all the things that essentially need to sort of essentially tell the story, really. If you think of it, there are three-dimensional people and objects on stage. That's where, as a lighting designer, I would say I'm a sculptor. I really do sort of just chink away. It's through color, it's through angle, it's through, um, it's really through telling your eye where to look. So I can say as much in a shadow as I can in uh, where the light's coming from. So if you think about a sculpture, it's similar. It's the same sort of thing. There are crevices in a sculpture. And so that is what I think that I do as a lighting designer. And then from the painting point of view, a lot of it has to do with color. And if, you know, when you see a show, there's a, there's a background, which might be um, uh, like a garden scene or something like that. Like if I think about Beauty and the Beast, the first show that I ever dis did for Disney Theatrical, it all took, so much of it took place in this town, which was this sort of idyllic, beautiful town, mm -hmm. which was a background that I had to sort of do the painting on. So when the sun sets, I have control as a lighting designer of the bottom of what that background is. And I can make that be a certain color and I can make the sky be a certain kind of blue. It's up to me to shift the color in order to tell the story that we're trying to tell. Now, when you're sculpting um, on a body, let's say Miles Frost, who plays Michael Jackson in the musical MJ that you did the lighting for, how did you approach lighting Miles Frost? Ton of research about Michael Jackson. Uh -huh. Because Michael Jackson was a manipulator of light in a really, really interesting way. And as we tell in our musical, actually, he was... Influenced by Fred Astaire, Bob Fosse, and the Nicholas Brothers would count also, I think, in this, and so many other people. When you think about Michael Jackson, very often he's in that white shirt with a fan lifting his shirt up and a lot of lights or the smoke that would come up as he, you know, entered the stage. If I... Um, Oh my God, they'll kill me on your TV show. But if I move this light that I have here, I can completely flatten myself out. <laughs> or I could go into silhouette, uh -huh. but not completely. But um, sorry, you guys. <laughs> Very sorry. <laughs> I love so the with, example. With Michael Jackson, I treated him, of course, with Chris Wielden in many, many different ways. Because just the silhouette of his body alone is something iconic. So there are many scenes where we just so show a silhouette of him. Uh -huh. There are many scenes where we might just light one side of him in order to get a better sort of sculpted view of him. So I trying to sort of bring out the iconic um, moments. Did I ruin the lighting? <laughs> I don't think so, but I love okay. the demonstration. You mentioned Christopher Wielden, who directed and choreographed MJ. She, he also directed and choreographed An American in Paris, which you also lit. Uh, what were your discussions like with Chris Wielden or Christopher Wielden uh, at the start of MJ? 
Chris and I met on Sweet Smell of Success through mm -hmm. Bob Crowley and Nick Heitner and Chris was the um, choreographer. And we've done a number of narrative ballets together since then and a number of abstract ballets together. Um, so we have a vocabulary of those two worlds, let's call it that. So our initial conversations about MJ really had to do with his music more than anything else and mm -hmm. the kind of movement of his body. So it may sound like, what does that have to do with lighting? But very often for me as a lighting designer, that kind of, when you get the history of what the director is trying to do from a storytelling point of view, that later on informs what the lighting ends up doing. But so Chris, uh, Chris at the beginning, Derek McLean is the set designer. The process really, really starts with, in this particular case, with Chris and the set designer. And once the set design starts to form, then I start to really become a part of the conversation. And there's a very strong visual um, idea that Chris has that we're in a rehearsal room in 1992. And part of it is flashbacks that Michael Jackson has. So it all sort of comes out of this rehearsal room. So in a conversation with a lighting designer, it would be, what does this rehearsal room look like? We have huge windows on both sides that Derek designed. So time of day was important, light coming through these enormous windows. So Chris and I talk about that. And then we talk about how do we transform this into a flashback that he might have, into something that's contemporary. We flip into the victory tour at some point. So the set almost is this sort of living feeling thing that light changes all the time. I want to back up just a little bit here. And you didn't intend to become a lighting designer, I gather. Is that correct? You kind of, you didn't stumble into it entirely, but you found your way into the theater via lighting. How did that happen? I just realized I would call myself sort of an accidental lighting designer. I uh, grew up in New York City. Mm -hmm. My parents took me to the theater all the time. It seems that I was just born loving musicals. I don't know how that happens, but I was even before I saw them. I guess maybe my parents played musicals, uh, you know, on the LPs on the record player then. Patrick, really, all I wanted to do was work in the theater. I loved the theater so much. I Today, it's the same thing for me. I love it. I love the storytelling. I love so much the fantasy of all of it. So I ended up going to Oberlin College, and I dabbled in everything. I tried stage management. I never wanted to be an actor. Stage management, I thought maybe I could be a director. Maybe I could be a producer. Maybe I could, all the different things. I worked in the shop. I... And then I, they had a, uh, an internship program where I could be a, I could get a full semester's credit to work. I could have been a neuroscientist and it was all part of this internship program, mm -hmm. meaning that it wasn't just in the theater. And I worked with the extraordinary Roger Morgan took me on the show. I remember Mama, Richard mm -hmm. Rogers' last musical. We right. went out of town to Philadelphia, came to New York in the period of my internship. So I was able to experience what an out-of-town show was. It was filled with all sorts of troubles. A lot of people were, were fired. So I was able to just watch. And that's what I did. I didn't know anything about lighting then. So I watched and observed the room, which was extremely helpful. There were so many people on the show. You know, the extraordinary thing also about our business is everybody treated me like a peer, even uh -huh. though I was 18 or 19 years old. And I was a little older. I must have been 20 years old you know they didn't treat me like they just treat that I was allowed into every conversation I went to every meeting with David Mitchell the um, set designer and then they met so many people I started getting job offers and I'd learned so much about lighting and I didn't go back to Oberlin so I do think I'm a product of on the job training <laughs> I did get some training in New York City there was a wonderful school called the studio in form of stage design by Lester Polikoff, where uh -huh. professional designers were teaching at the school. So I had Peggy Clark teaching me, Arden Fingerhut, Theron Musser. It was an, ex an extraordinary time. All these classic talents in lighting design. Um, Natasha, how do you suppose the fact that you grew up uh, in New York City affected how you view light as opposed to, say, if you'd grown up in Southern California? 
Patrick, what an interesting question. I think that I probably, I think that I may possibly have an urban viewpoint, an urban lens, let's say, to lighting. Because a city is so filled with jagged architecture and a city is filled with stories the minute you walk out the door, whether it's the doorman, whether it's the, the, the subway teller, the person you bump into on the subway. That's a really interesting question. And it's not like, I don't know what fresh air looks like and <laughs> skies or any of that. But huh? no, I wasn't somebody who was lucky enough to sit by the ocean and see the sunrise and sunset. Well, because what's fascinating is that as a lighting designer, you have to go to Paris, you know, in an American in Paris and 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 the color of Paris. And even in MJ, I think there's a Hollywood sequence, isn't there an MJ where you do go to the West Coast at one point in the show? For example, in terms of an American in Paris, was your lighting influenced by the tree colors of the French flag or perhaps musicals that you may have seen by Vincent Minnelli? or The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. Those are all references that we, I certainly were part of in, in American Paris. I also, I lived in France when I was in 11th yeah. grade. So uh, France means an awful lot to me. Our tryout was in Paris. Um, how lucky could we be? But Paris is a really interesting city in the sense that the buildings were, I think by some decree, and somebody can look this up, they're all a similar color. They're kind of a sandy mm -hmm. color. So Paris has its, uh, uh, one of the beauties of Paris is that it has a very sort of monochromatic look to all the buildings that the, that light plays such an important role on because it's the light that changes the color of these buildings. Unlike New York, which is again, jagged buildings, London is buildings of all sorts of different colors. And um, so Paris, that was a huge part of it. Certainly Vincent Minnelli had a lot to do with it too, because the beginning of the show took place right after the war. Mm -hmm. Nobody had any money in Paris. And so we did that entire prologue, which told the story, the story of our character, Jerry Mulligan, was all in black and white. So that's a really strong idea for a lighting designer. Mm -hmm. So we have to do black and white. And black and white, by the way, in the theater very often means light lavenders and light blues. And if you think of film noir and black and white, there's a lot of shadows. So these are the kind of things that I think of as lighting designers. We're trying to talk about lighting a little bit. And then the rest of the show bursts into color and it does burst into sort of a Vincent Minnelli kind of feel to it, which is, I would call it heightened color in a way. Obviously, Natasha, you mentioned the actors that you're dealing with in American in Paris or in MJ or in any of your other shows. How can uh, you as a lighting designer enhance, help the emotional content of the character and help the actor realize that character? That's my job. That's mm -hmm. it. To me, that is what you've just asked me, Patrick, is the most important part of my job. It almost rises above storytelling, or maybe it's equal to that, which is that I, I believe strongly that I have to make every actor on the stage look absolutely beautiful. So beautiful within the context of the story. Thriller, the number that we do in, um, in, the, in MJ, the costumes are all red and Michael Jackson is in a white shirt with black pants. What happens during the arc of that particular number is that he starts uh, sort of well lit and kind of of today. And then it, the shadows just get deeper and deeper and deeper on his face. The follow spot starts to pull out, meaning dim down the light that would be lighting the front of his face. And these lights start to take over that are that make shadows that go down the front of his face. So that's the case, I think, where it uh, describes what can happen about how a character might be lit. When something is called for to be very dark, you've long day's journey into night, perhaps, how do you balance making it so that the audience can see what is happening and yet get the atmospheric effect that you want. 
you know, Jessica Lang, she won the Tony Award for Long yes, Beach Journal tonight. And you did too. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> what an amazing performance. The set was done in a way where it jutted out into the audience. So, you know, we have one of the most famous film actresses right at the apex. It's almost sitting in the audience's lap playing a heroin addict. She's ravaged with drugs and that. But... At the same time, she's so luminescent that instead of saying, okay, we're going to make her look like, you know, she's got big black circles under her eyes and that she's been in the corner doing heroin, the luminescent part of it sort of added. So she looked, I did my best to just make her look beautiful, as beautiful as Jessica Lang could look, which isn't hard. And um, then there's a kind of, you get a kind of, um, counterpoint to a character that way, which we do, I do very often in lighting, which is if you, the story may be so horrific, but that doesn't mean that the character themselves is not looking good and um, finding some sort of way against the adversity of this horrible story. In that final scene of Long Day's Journey in Tonight, Mary Tyrone is in her reverie going back to the moment she met James Tyrone, and we were so happy for a while. So you're literally lighting that character at the moment in her 20s when she met James Tyrone. How can you help youthen her in the course of that scene? Patrick, you just gave me full body goose pimples <laughs> about that moment. <laughs> it's a great because moment. That's exactly right. We were reliving that memory with her, which youthened her at the same time. It seems to me that you defer. I think you described yourself once as a chameleon in terms of having to take on whatever coloration the designer, the, the, your designers, your collaborators take. When do you get to not put your foot down, but insist on your own prerogatives as a liney designer? Yeah, I, chameleon is the, uh, yeah, that I'm ever changing because so many, you know, different creative teams have different ideas and needs. You know, a different director is going to look at um, Long Day's Journey and Tonight one way, then a different, uh, another director is going to look at it. To, to what end? to put my foot down, if you know what I mean. Unless I believe that it's really going to help the story. So that's certainly not me standing there and stomping my foot. It's more like, what if we, can we try? And one of the great things about lighting, especially today, is that we're instant. We're the, out of all, I guess sound would be the same way, and projection perhaps, that we, Lighting can respond right away. I can say, wouldn't this moment, you know, we could have done Mary Tyrone completely different. I could have said, this is not working. Her memory is, I believe that her memory, even though she's having this great memory, we should show it from our point of view, which is that she is about to die. So I'm going to light her from the back. I'm going to make her face look all craggy. And that's how I believe it should be. So we would talk about something like that. We might even try something like that and then go, you know, it's not resonating the right way and then do whatever it is that we end up doing. So I, I, it's honestly way more collaborative than me stomping my foot. I'd love <laughs> to stomp my foot one day. That would be a lot of fun. <laughs> the thing about uh, lighting is that there are millions of different color chips that you, you work with. Um, do the... Do the limitless choices or the apparently limitless choices drive you crazy? How do you manage to synthesize it down to a choice? Patrick, it's gotten so much easier for us. When I started, you used to have to pick a gel color and uh, a color that you would put in front of the light that, so I picked pink for somebody, for some to light somebody's face. And you, if that color doesn't work and, uh, then I'd have to pick another color. So that means people would have to get out a ladder, pull out the gel, cut a new one, put a new one in, and that like could be in 40 lights or something like that. So color interacts. A blue with a red background is going to be different than blue with a white background. It changes what one how colors react to each other. So I've spent my whole career dealing with how colors interact with each other. What has happened now in the last five years 
is that we now have these lights you, that uh, we don't put gel in them anymore. They're LEDs and they can cross, they can be any color you want them to be. So it's been completely liberating to me. But I have a strong background in sort of what color does with each other. So uh, like I'm looking at your purple shirt right uh -huh. now. If I were lighting you, I'd probably just add a little purple, not in this context, of course, in the theater, I might add a little purple to the light. All I do is I tell a moving light programmer, you know, we have these kind of, again, extraordinary artists behind these consoles um, and say, could you just add a little purple to that? Could you add a little red? Could you add a little blue? So for me, it's, it's been completely liberating. Are lighting designers emotional manipulators? <laughs> uh, well, I guess you just found out our secret. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, I think that's, maybe that's how we should be built. <laughs> as emotional manipulators, because you are editors as well. You actually determine to some extent where the audience looks, when the audience looks, and to some extent how the audience looks. So are you aware of emotionally manipulating the audience for the desired effect? I mean, maybe it's giving away secrets, but yes. I mean, I think actually that that is a, a large part of my job. And you can tell, so I do, I am somewhat like a film editor. Uh, again, it's all a collaboration with the rest of the creative team. It's not just me alone. If an actor is standing stage right and I'm lighting stage left, I am uncollaborative. <laughs> but I, um, uh, yes, uh, um, I just did a show down at the public theater called Suffs about the suffragist movement a hundred years ago. And it's on a black, steps that are kind of like showing what the backdrop of government to us all the time but very often we need to have the audience look in one direction in order to get a piece of scenery off on the other uh mm -hmm. the other side or actors are getting ready to get on on the other side or sometimes what happens emotionally when you compress the stage which lighting can do and then you open it up the contrast of compression versus sort of freedom, which, you know, so much of that mm -hmm. story is about being being shackled and then opening up and I guess, you know, you could say symbolically getting the boat, but. You mentioned obviously that when you came into the business, it was largely a, a business that was dominated, a genre, an area of theater that was dominated by women. Why do you suppose that is? Um, you know, I don't know. I really, really don't know. I really want somebody to tell me and somebody to, to historically sort of figure that out. I, I, you know, a lot of people used to say it's because of exactly what you were talking about, the emotional aspect of lighting. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, the, at the time, and maybe we'd even say today, women are more emotional than men on a, not more emotional, but a different kind of way of showing emotion. And Jean Rosenthal was one of the great pioneers of lighting. She wrote a wonderful book. It's out of print that anybody who's even not in the theater, I think, should read. It's a story of her life. It's a story of working in the theater. Uh, she wrote it just before she died. She died young of cancer. It's called The Magic of Light. And it's a wonderful book. People said that if it was Medea, you could smell the, you know, the, you could smell the ocean as, um, you watch the show. She seemed to have some sort of real understanding of a kind of this, what light can do viscerally to our, or to our, to the audience member. I, God, I wish I had met her. We have to uh, wrap up, unfortunately, but I did want to get into the fact that you've been asked to light a number of productions that dealt in fantasy. Maybe that was part of your Disney uh, sort of association, Aladdin, Aida, Beauty and the Beast. There was certain lighting that came into fantasy, a heightened reality. What made you so good at that? Color has always been, I love lush color. I guess I just love it. And it uh, ended up being a, you know, a good fit. Color plays a big role, I think, in fantasy very often. You know, as a lighting designer, it, it it's, it's a very exciting profession. We're the only ones that walk into the theater with the set designer as the set is done, the costumes are done, all of that is looked at beforehand. We walk in 
to a blank page. Of course, we've done a ton of work. We've had the lights hung. We know what we're about to do. But that moment comes. The clock is ticking. It costs a lot of money. We have to work fast. And there's an adrenaline to all of it that is extremely exciting. And, uh, and I think that that oddly plays into the fantasy of it all. You've done more than 60 Broadway shows, I think, by my count uh, or thereabouts. You've been nominated for a Tony Award 14 times, won six times. What remains to be conquered for Natasha Katz? Patrick, I just love what I do. I, I just, uh, new shows is what <laughs> I would like to conquer. Just more work and new shows. Well, uh, you know, as they say um, in Sunday in the Park with George, Natasha, show us more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let us see more in your own particular vision. It has been so delightful to speak with you. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Patrick. It's been wonderful. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back next month with another look at the brave and singular artists who are helping theater that fabulous invalid regain its invaluable place in American culture. I'm Patrick Pacheco.